welcome to the next episode of Is There a God? And once again, we are pulling arguments out of a hat. And we've got a lot to go yet. We've gone through a lot already, and we've got a lot to go yet. So let's keep things moving along. The next argument for or against the existence of God is... An argument against the existence of God. Man has free will. God is all-powerful. How could we have free will? If God is all-knowing, then he knows what we're going to do before we do it, and therefore we don't really have free will. But we do have free will, don't we? Well, first of all, do we have free will even without a God? That's a matter for some debate. A lot of people disagree on this. Are we more uh, philosophically libertarian or philosophically deterministic? I mean, are the chemical reactions of my brain forcing me towards an inescapable conclusion? Or do I have a choice of what I do next? Do you think that uh, the electrons firing inside my brain are acting in a quantum sense, which makes them unpredictable? We could say that I cannot be deterministic, that I definitely do have several possible futures to choose from. But then, what about parallel universes? If there are an infinite number of parallel universes, then maybe that means I don't have free will. Maybe that means that I am compelled to do every possible thing in every possible universe, which means that there are inexplicable universes, where I'm just acting in a ridiculous manner for no reason, and not even knowing why, just out of necessity. On the other hand, what if there's an infinite number of parallel universes, but I'm choosing which universes I experience by making a conscious decision, so I'm actually in control of which version of reality I'm aware of? Whoa! The point is that man has free will is not a definite fact. It is something. I, I like to think we have free will, but I can't prove that. But let's just say we have free will. Let's just choose to say that we can choose to say that we can choose to say. I must be getting tired of getting silly. Does God's ability to see the future mean that we don't have free will? Well, no. Not necessarily. First of all, not everybody agrees that God can see the future at all, and of the people who do, not everybody agrees that God can see the future of human activity. I said in a previous uh, episode that, you know, there is a very popular theological belief that God can see the future of natural events, but not foresee the outcome of human activity. But even if he could, there's the pipes banging, even if he could, That's not necessarily controlling it. Think about this. Let's say I have a time machine. And I tell you, pick a number from 1 to 10. And you pick a number. Who made you pick that number? Not me. You decided. Now I jump in my time machine, I go back in time a few minutes and watch. I stay far away as not to interfere. I'm peeping in the window and I watch myself ask you the same question. Pick a number from 1 to 10 and you pick a number. I knew what number you were going to pick. But, I didn't force you to pick that number. I, just the fact that I knew it doesn't, and, and again, maybe there's an infinite number of timelines, and every time I go back in time, all the possibilities reset to their starting positions. Who knows? But let's just say that it doesn't work like that, for the sake of argument. The fact that I know what number you're going to pick doesn't mean that you didn't pick it of your own free will. So in that sense, we could say that God is not controlling the outcome by seeing it. He's just passively receiving information before it happens. So in that sense, you could still have free will and not contradict the ability to see the future. Next argument. An argument for the existence of God Atheists suffer, people who don't believe in God suffer in their lives, but people who do believe in God, they recover from suffering, with God's help. Well, first of all, if we're saying that people who believe in God recover from their hardships, we're 
establishing that they have hardships, which makes them no different from an atheist in that sense. So, really the question is, do you need to believe in God in order to get through the difficult times in your life? Not necessarily, but it helps. It does help. Believing in a higher power will help you through difficult times. But there are other things that can also help you through difficult times. In fact, most people who have hardships in their lives, if you ask them later, how did you get through it? How did you emotionally deal with it? The most common answer you're going to get is, my friends helped me, or my family helped me. I mean, there are a lot of things. Sense of humor, therapy, booze. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of things that people will turn to to get through the difficult times. In fact, a lot of, a lot of times people get through the hard stuff just because they don't have a choice and they have to get through it. So you don't need... Re religion can help, but you don't actually... We don't all need it, is what I'm saying. Some people, it's the best thing they got. Some people got something else that they can fall back on. Like a security blanket, even, you know? There are just so many things. Next argument. This is an argument for the existence of God. Near-death experiences. These are eyewitnesses. These people lying on the hospital bed, they die, their vital signs stop, they go towards the light, they see the light, they see faces of angels, dead ancestors, they feel the love surrounding them, and then they come back to their bodies, they come back to life, and they remember everything that happened to them. Now most skeptics will say, well, you know what, your brain is deprived of oxygen. One of the things that happens when your brain is deprived of oxygen is you hallucinate. And they can prove this by simply repeating the same events under laboratory conditions, depriving the brain of oxygen, and then people usually see the same tunnel vision, you know, see faces, you know, they might feel euphoric. You know, they get pretty much the same results. Some people say, well, the brain is shut off. There is no brain activity. Here's the neighbor's radio playing. There is no brain activity, so how could they be experiencing anything, but again, you know, the uh, counterpoint to that is, well, you know, your brain is active part of the time, even if it stops being active, when it comes back online again, uh, you can lose track of time, you can have a, an experience of a few seconds that seems like an hour. I mean, that's what dreams are. Okay, fair enough. But here's my question. How do we know that depriving the brain of oxygen is really causing a hallucination, or if depriving the brain of oxygen is simply making your body think it's dying, so you start to leave it and start to get a glimpse of the other side. Maybe those simulations are actually triggering real near-death experiences. That is a possibility which must be taken into consideration. Just the fact that we can duplicate the effects of a near-death experience doesn't mean that we're necessarily identifying the cause of these experiences. So in this sense, it's really 50-50. Maybe the things you're seeing are real, maybe they're not. And for most people, most people will tell you seeing is believing. So the people that have these experiences seem pretty convinced and rightly so. I mean, if I see a hat in front of me, I'm going to think it's really there. And somebody makes a logical argument that it isn't there, isn't really going to sound very convincing. But uh, near-death experience, this, uh, this could go either way. This could go either way. Then there's astral projection. Out-of-body experience without actually being near dead. This is when a person is in an altered state of consciousness, an altered meditative state, and they feel themselves leave their body, and uh, they're usually connected. Here, upstairs floorboards creak. There's a loose ceiling fixture. And they, uh, they usually see a string, a silver string, connecting their spirit to their bodies. And what causes that? Well, that could be a dream, that could be a hallucination, that could be any number of things, but the string. That's the thing that gets me. 
Why do they all see the string? I mean, that's not a cultural thing. Even people who don't know they're supposed to see a string see a string. I'm going to have to put a pin in this one. <laughs> I'm not going to throw this one at the camera like the others. I'm putting a pin in this one. This is a possible. It's not a proof, but it is a pretty strong indicator that there's something metaphysical, something supernatural. Near-death experiences and astral, and specifically astral projection, that's a pretty strong... I'm not going to say it's definitely right or it's definitely wrong. I'm just going to say we're going to hold off on that one. <laughs> okay. Next up, an argument against God, specifically an argument against Jesus Christ. The Gospels were written after the fact. Nobody was following around with a little... Notepad, ooh, ooh, what is in? Blessed are the what? Blessed are the what? What, the cheesemakers? Oh, peacemakers, okay, I got it. Nobody was doing that. He died in uh, presumably 30 AD. First, the earliest known gospel was written in 70 AD. How the hell did people in 70 AD know what was happening 40 years earlier? First of all, first of all, 40 years later is not that long a time period. Just that, just that the 70 AD is the earliest known gospel doesn't mean that there wasn't a gospel written earlier that we just haven't found yet. I mean, you got to admit, they're going back pretty far. That's pretty close. From 30 AD to 70 AD, that's not a huge... When you're talking about a span of 2,000 years, this is not a huge difference. So, <clears throat> you know, so this really... There could have been another gospel written before that. And let's say there was Again, 40 years, not that long a period. I mean, take Watergate, for example. The Watergate incident was about 40 years ago. How do I know about it? Why do I know what Watergate is if it happened 40 years ago? Well, because, number one, it's common knowledge. Number two, there have been other books written about it. And even if there weren't, I'd still know about it because it's been discussed. I've heard about it. I know people who were, you know, following the story when it was happening. In fact, I used to work in a radio station years ago that was an affiliate that carried the G. Gordon Liddy show. And so I was actually listening to G. Gordon Liddy. Did I just spit coming out of my mouth? I was actually listening to G. Gordon Liddy telling stories about Watergate. So if I tell you that I know something about Watergate right now, I'm not just making it up. I could be telling you what I heard from Liddy. So I can find out what happened 40 years ago. So why couldn't the people who wrote the Gospels 40 years after the fact have found out what happened 40 years earlier? It's not that difficult. I mean, and if he's... And if, and if Christ is preaching to, like, these huge choirs, the Sermon on the Mount, there's probably going to be a lot of people who remember and are telling the stories, hey, let me tell you about this Jesus guy. Could have been common knowledge. So, so this just doesn't hold up. It just doesn't hold up. Next argument. Argument for the existence of God, or not so much for God, but against atheism. It goes like this. Atheism is a religion. Bill Maher had something interesting to say about this. He said that uh, saying that atheism is a religion is kind of like saying that abstinence is a sex position. I thought that was clever. Uh, but it's the idea of, you know, you're accepting on faith that there isn't a God, and that is not necessarily any better than accepting on faith that there is a God. Well, I agree to a point. But really, it comes down, is atheism a religion? It depends. It depends on your uh, definition of religion. If by religion you mean worldview, uh, opinion about what is going on, opinion about what the big picture is, the answer to everything, then, uh, then yeah, in that sense we could say that atheism is a religion in that it's a worldview, it's a vital statistic, you know, just like your ethnicity or your nationality or your height or your weight or your eye color. It's just another way of categorizing people. But in the sense of being an organized belief system, a system of worship, no, it's not that at all. Obviously not. So in this sense, but there could also be atheistic 
religious belief systems. Like suppose you're part of a UFO cult. You might not believe in a god, but you are still practicing some sort of a religion. So in that sense, again, atheism isn't a religion in that sense, but it can, an atheist, somebody who doesn't believe in a god can be a religious person in another sense. But does that uh, necessarily mean atheism is uh, right or wrong? No, it doesn't say anything about it. Just means that uh, maybe a person who believes that there isn't a God could be wrong, could be right. And again, another thing that comes up very often, and this, and this is a personal pet peeve of mine, people say that, uh, you know, well, you know, an atheist is the uh, same thing as an agnostic. No, 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 no. It's, it's a very different thing. And I, th I think, as a matter of fact, I'm going to save that, that uh, discussion for... i got another one in here. But um, the thing is, there is a word which has fallen out of use, and I think we have to bring it back into use, and that is the word humanist. Humanism is saying... Never mind if there's a God or not. What do we need to deal with on Earth right now? That's a really good word. I think that we should all be more humanist. Okay? You can believe there's a God, you can believe there's not a God, but Earth first. Living people first. This world first. I think that's a really good idea. And for some reason we've just created this, uh, this false dichotomy of you know, you have to be an atheist or, you know, a religious, you know, devotee and a fanatic and everything. And, and no, 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 it's a false dichotomy. We don't need it. But in any sense, whether you define atheism as a religion or not, it really has no bearing on whether it's right or wrong. Okay, next argument. This one is not so much an argument against God, but an argument against the supernatural. Astrology can be faked. And other things like ESP, you know, fortune telling, etc., etc., you know, telekinesis, precognition, etc., etc. All these supernatural things can be faked. Well, real things can be faked. I mean, movies fake things all the time. They can make a fake car chase, a fake gunfight. That doesn't mean there weren't real car chases and real gunfights. So, really, just the fact that you can fake something doesn't mean it isn't real. I can make a fake moon landing. Doesn't mean there isn't a real moon landing. One of the big... Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually test astrology by testing an astrologer. Usually what they do is they fake astrology, somebody falls for it and goes, Ha ha, you fell for it. You know, that means... That proves that there's no real power in astrology because... You know, I was able to do it uh, as a fake, and I got the same results. That, that's like showing somebody a fake plant and saying, you think this is a real plant? Ha! Huh, it fooled you. It's a fake plant. That proves there's no such thing as real plants. Okay. There could be a faker out there. There could even be a lot of con artists out there. Doesn't mean there isn't a real thing. I mean, there could be quacks. There could be people practicing medicine who are bad at it and don't know what they're doing. That doesn't mean there aren't real doctors. I can give you a placebo for a disease, tell you it's medicine, and make you feel better. That doesn't mean there isn't real medicine out there. And there could be bad medicine that doesn't work. Doesn't mean there isn't real medicine. So in that sense, just because you can fake psychics or supernatural phenomena doesn't mean there isn't real thing out there somewhere. Doesn't prove anything. Next argument. Argument against the existence of God. There are no big miracles now. All the big miracles happened a long time ago, and nothing big happens now. No uh, global floods, no parting of the seas, no, you know, raining of frogs down from the sky. What happened to the... Nowadays, a miracle is, oh, I thought that car was going to hit me, but it didn't. Why did the big miracles happen a long time ago, and... No big miracles happen now. Well, there's actually a very logical reason. 
If we think of God as a parent, which is very common, think about this. When you're a baby, when you were a little bitty baby, what did your parents do for you? They fed you. They dressed you. They undressed you. They changed your diapers. They put you to bed. They put you in a stroller and pushed you around. They carried you. They did everything for you. Then you grow up. What do your parents do for you when you grow up? Do they still feed you? Do they still tuck you in at night? Do they still carry you? No, usually, uh... Loose light fixture, creaking ceiling. Usually, they just a, uh, a shoulder to cry on, an advisor. Well, why don't your parents do everything for you as an adult that they did for you when you were a baby? The answer is because you can do things for yourself. You've grown up. You can take care of yourself now. And so in that sense, we could say that maybe, just maybe, the human race has grown up. Maybe the human race is so grown up that we don't need the big miracles anymore. Maybe we don't need somebody to part the seas for us because we can build a bridge. Now, maybe we don't need a flood to do away with the evildoers because we have a prison to put them in. Maybe we don't need the big things anymore. Maybe we just need emotional support and an advisor. It's a possibility. In fact, it's a very, it's not just possible, it's plausible. It's very realistic to think that, that something like that could be the case. Which is why I think that the rapture is such a ridiculous concept. I mean, that's like saying, well, when mom and dad see what a good job I did living on my own, they're going to reward me by letting me move back in with them forever. That just doesn't make any sense. That just sounds crazy. Next argument. An argument against God, the Bible is wrong. There are things in the Bible that are provably wrong. It says there was a flood. That flood didn't really happen. The Bible is wrong. It said that we were created six days and we know for a fact that we weren't. The Bible is wrong. And if the Bible is wrong, then there can't be any God at all. First of all, not everybody believes in the Christian God. And of the people who do believe in the Christian God, not everybody takes the Bible literally. Of the people who do take the Bible literally, they are a very tiny minority. I mean, okay, there are a lot of them in the United States, but globally speaking, they're a minority. And historically speaking, they're actually very recent, a very recent development of people who take the Bible literally. So in that sense, if something in the Bible is wrong, does that prove that every belief system is wrong? What about the pagans? What about people, what about the Eastern religions? Are they wrong if the Bible is wrong? And what about, what about the Hebrews who existed before the book of Genesis? Think about it. The book of Exodus is older than the book of Genesis. That means that there were people walking around believing in the God of the Bible without the story of the Garden of Eden. So, apparently, belief in this particular God is not contingent upon that particular story. I mean, if I pick up a, a book right now, if I pick up a, a history book on the French Revolution, open it up to page one, add something that wasn't there previously, like two plus two is five, and then say, see, this book is wrong. Therefore, you know, everything it says must be false. Not necessarily. Could be that I just added something that was wrong. And besides, the Bible isn't a single book. It's several books that were compiled together by a committee. In this sense, we could say, um, the Bible is just a bunch of books. And if one of them's wrong, it doesn't necessarily reflect the others. 
because they weren't all written at the same time, in the same language, under the same circumstances, by the same people, or for the same reasons. Suppose that I were to take, I mean, some people say, well, if you don't believe in one thing in the Bible, you know, oh, the, they got the first thing wrong, as if there was one group of people that wrote the whole Bible all at once. They couldn't even get the, uh, the creation story right. If they got that wrong, why should I believe anything else it says? Suppose I took a copy of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, which I have a copy somewhere. It's over there. I don't feel like going to get it, but, you know, I'm going to go get it right now. This is the Thomas Paine Collection. Lost my uh, near-death experience one. Let's say that I took a copy of that book, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And I said, okay, just because I feel like it, I'm going to take a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf, which I don't have a copy of. And I'm going to glue them together. Back cover to front cover, I'm going to glue them together and call it one book. And I'm going to call it the Super Important Everything Book. Then the next time somebody quotes a line from Thomas Paine's Common Sense, Somebody else can say, well, why should I believe this super everything book? It says that uh, we should put the Jews in the concentration camps. If they couldn't get the first part right, why should I believe the second part? Because they're two different books that have nothing to do with each other. And the Bible is many books that have nothing to do with each other, except they have... The only thing they have in common is they all have something to do with God. That's it. And somebody just stuck them all together for that purpose and rejected several of them that were considered non-canonical or apocryphal or pseudepigraphal or just not very popular or not very convenient. Tell me that they all have to be right or they all have to be wrong? That's ridiculous. And again, that's just one religion. What about all the rest of them? Doesn't prove anything. Next up, argument against God. If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? This is a very common argument, and the general stock response you get from religious people is, well, because man has free will. You know, God uh, allows us to, you know, have free will, and therefore we can do bad things to one another. Okay, let's say that uh, I point a gun at somebody's head and I pull the trigger. I have free will. I can do that. But the bullet doesn't have free will. Why doesn't God just stop the bullet in the air? And again, what about earthquakes and floods and tornadoes? They don't have free will. Why doesn't God just stop them? God is all loving and so perfect and so wise, he should stop bad things from happening. Right? Well, not necessarily. Think of it this way. The universe is a nation. And if you believe in an all-powerful God, which not everybody who believes in some sort of God believes that their God is all-powerful, but if you believe in an all-powerful God, then God is kind of like the government of the universe. So how do we want the government to be run? Well, there are different opinions on the subject, but I am uh, of the opinion that the government that governs least governs best. Take a very libertarian point of view. I don't want to live in a nanny state. So why would I want to live in a nanny universe? I don't want the government coming into my house uninvited. So why would I want God coming into my house uninvited? I don't want the government watching my over my every shoulder, watching over my shoulder, my every move, making sure I do everything right. So why would I want God doing that? Wouldn't make any sense. Wouldn't make any sense. I would want God to mind his own business most of the time. That's it. Free will 
it's not just that we have free will, it's that we need free will. Life would suck without free will. We wouldn't be able to move forward. We wouldn't be able to invent anything. We wouldn't be able to discover anything if we didn't have challenges to overcome. We need evil in the world just to give us a problem to solve. Just to give us something to deal with. Free market. Free market nation, free market government, free market capitalist society, and free market universe. So yeah, and if God is smart, he would know that. He would know that. And he would, and he would take a very libertarian view of running the universe. And the God that governs least governs best. Next argument. An argument against the existence of God. Men reach their sexual peak at 20. Women reach their sexual peak at 40. This is badly designed. Bullshit it is. It's great design. It gives us something to look forward to. How fun would it be if... if sex made sense? Now, of course, we can expand on this and say, well, there are other things in the human body that are badly designed, like, uh, you know, putting a waste disposal, you know, facility right next to a recreation facility, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things in the body are badly designed. But think about it. If we're a product of natural selection, survival of the fittest, and we're the survivors, that must mean we're pretty fit. So everything in us must serve some kind of a logical purpose. And if it serves a logical purpose, then a logical creator would have put it there. So no matter what happens, if, if we evolve naturally, everything about us is going to make sense. And if we're designed, everything about us is going to be exactly the same as if it evolved naturally. So you can't really use that as a basis for making a, a determination. Unless you think there actually is something badly designed which would suggest that an incompetent or at the very least fallible creator. I mean, that's a possibility. Why do women have orgasms? We don't really need that to survive. I mean, other animals don't have it. I mean, other species don't, don't have female orgasms. Why do humans have it? I don't know. But I'd call that an intelligent design. Anyway, it doesn't really prove anything one way or another. That's my point. There might be a reason for it, but an intelligent designer would design us the same way we evolved. Actually, an intelligent designer would use a free market system and let us evolve naturally. So, <laughs> either way, okay. Argument for the existence of God. We need there to be religion and God in order for there to be a right and a wrong. Okay, this uh, has three parts to it. First of all, God has to be able to establish right from wrong so that right and wrong can exist in the universe. God has to tell us right from wrong so that we'll know. And third, God has to promise reward or punishment so that we'll actually follow right from wrong. All three of these are wrong. First of all, do we need God to make there be a right and a wrong in order for there to be a right and a wrong? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because right and wrong can be practical. What is good? The intent to make happy. What is evil? The intent to make unhappy. That's pretty much it. I mean, you can try to make it a little bit more complicated than that, but that's basically what it is. Good is trying to make somebody else happy, and evil is trying to make somebody else unhappy. Well, we want to be happy, don't we? And we know that there is a pattern involved. We know that certain things make us happy, and certain things make us unhappy. So, as long as we are not idiots and can figure that out, we're going to be able to know right from wrong. There's going to be a right and a wrong for practical reasons. And we're going to figure it out without being told. And some people say, well, okay, well, the Ten Commandments, of course. Really? Look at, uh, 
thou shalt not commit adultery, for example. You might say, well, if God didn't tell us that, we wouldn't know. Think about it. That was written at a time when people had prearranged marriages when they were children, essentially. So there was no dating. It's like you hit puberty and you got married to the person your parents picked for you. Well, nowadays there's dating. There's no rule. Well, if I'm just dating someone, can I cheat on her? There's no commandment that says that I can't. So how do I know if that's right or wrong? Well, I know it's wrong. It's obvious because I know it causes unhappiness. It, it is an expression of dishonesty and a breach of trust which causes emotional distress. So I can figure out without being told that it's wrong. So obviously, we can figure out right from wrong without having it explained to us. I mean, sometimes, you know, when we're children, we need our parents to explain it, but, you know, so that we figure it out sooner than later, figure it out the easy way as opposed to the hard way. But generally, we can figure out right from wrong. And third, rewards and punishments. I really find it hard to believe that there is anybody walking the earth right now who is thinking, I'd love to kill everybody, but I don't want to go to hell. No. People are good to each other because they're good people, and people are bad to each other because they're bad people. Or they're just in a bad mood that particular day. Or maybe they are trying to be good people and just aren't very good at it. But whatever, whatever the reason, I don't think anybody is really thinking about the next life in this life. At least not in determining how we act towards each other. I think we generally care about each other. And here is a little test. If you really think that the purpose of being good is to get into heaven, consider this. If you had a choice between going to heaven yourself or sending somebody else, somebody that you really cared about, into heaven in your place, what would you choose? And would that be a good thing or a bad thing? I think most people would agree that the good thing to do is a selfless thing to do. To say, oh, well, I want to go to heaven, but I'll let you go ahead of me. Well, if the purpose of being good is to get into heaven, why would it be good to do that? Because it's just good. And because sometimes people are just good. In fact, I would say almost all the time, if not all the time, people are good because they're good people. Because they care about others, not because they want to get rewarded. So, all three counts. The, the philosophical good and evil, the intellectual good and evil, and the motivational good and evil, none of these hold up. We don't actually need it. Next argument. argument against the existence of God, the flying spaghetti monster argument. Also known as the, uh, uh, what's his name's teapot argument, uh, for, uh, Ro, Ro J, I think, or the invisible pink unicorn argument. But it's most commonly known as the flying spaghetti monster argument. It goes like this. If I cannot prove whether something is there or not, it doesn't make sense to assume it is there. It makes more sense to assume it isn't there. Fairly simple thing. Except, this is not speculation. Okay, for analogy, let's say I'm in a room all by myself, no windows, just one door and no windows, and I don't know what's outside. And I say to myself, I think there's a green Ferrari parked in front of the building. I'm just guessing. What are the odds that I'm going to be right? practically nil. So it would make more sense to assume that I'm wrong. Okay, same situation. I'm in a room all by myself. No windows, one door. I can't see what's outside. I have no way of knowing. And a guy comes in from outside and says, hey, guess what? I just saw a green Ferrari parked outside. And then he leaves. 
Now I'm thinking, hmm, I have no way of knowing whether he was telling the truth or whether he was lying. I'm going to guess he was telling the truth. What are the odds that I'm going to be right? Well, now they're about 50-50. Because I'm not just making up a possibility, I'm making a determination whether or not to believe a witness. And maybe I'm a pretty good judge of character. Maybe I can read his facial expressions and say, he looks like he's telling the truth. So if I think there's a green Ferrari outside now, I might be right. There's a pretty good chance I might be right. In the flight spaghetti monster argument, we're just making it up hypothetically. But in the God argument, we're not just making it up hypothetically. It's not just a speculation. This started with people coming down off of mountains with stone tablets going, I just saw this guy up there called God. We're not just making it up. We're deciding whether or not to believe that guy. Do I believe that guy's telling the truth? That makes it a character judgment, not a guess. Next argument. Signs, signs everywhere, signs. This is an argument for the existence of God, signs. People see miraculous things. They see a tortilla and it looks like Jesus. See a cheese sandwich and it looks like the Virgin Mary. See a cloud, see an iceberg. Yeah, anybody see that Billy Connolly story about, uh, about the iceberg shaped like Jesus? That's a good one. <laughs> Here comes Billy Connolly. Quick, I'll pretend I'm an iceberg. <laughs> you should check that out. That's funny. Uh, but these signs, these signs, aren't these proof? Aren't these God communicating with us? Well, no. Pretty much not. There's really no way to back these up because things that aren't supposed to look like things can look like things. I find shapes and clouds all the time. I've been to a lot of head shrinkers in my day, and I've been given the inkblot test, the Rorschach test. I've looked at a blot of ink that I knew was not intended to be anything. It was just a blot of ink. And I could see, not just, I can kind of make out, I mean, I could clearly see this is a dragon. It's a dragon in flight. I can see the eyes. I can see the teeth. I can see the tail. I can see the wings. I can see the horns. I can see the, the, the scales going on the back. I could see a dragon clearly. But I know, show that to somebody else, he's not going to see a dragon. He's going to see something completely different. The human mind can perceive things because the mind, the brain knows that the eyes are not that accurate. It has to interpret what it's seeing. So in this sense, those kind of signs really are not reliable at all. Okay, that's one kind of sign. But what about like the crying statues or the, the bleeding hands on the crucifixes or, uh, or there was this one particular very famous uh, publicized incident in India where Ganesh, uh, and that's uh, this, uh, this guy here. Hello, Ganesh. This is Lord Ganesh, the elephant-headed Hindu god, who, according to the stories, he demanded milk. Yeah, Ganesh wanted milk. And so people started putting milk in front of statues of Ganesh in temples or in their homes, all over the place, and the milk disappeared while they were looking at it. And then one day he announced that he had enough milk and the milk stopped disappearing. He drank milk! Well, what could possibly cause that? Well, I will tell you. I have no idea. Hoax? Perhaps. But a pretty elaborate one. I mean, they got this stuff on camera. I mean, if this is a hoax, there was a lot of people involved and a lot of work that went into it. I'm going to put a pin in this one, too. 
So far we got near death ex we've got astral projection and Ganesh drinking milk. Those are the two so far that really seem to I really can't form a strong argument against. Next one, an argument for God. Ghosts. One of the big complaints about God is you can't see him. But you could see a ghost. People see ghosts all the time. All over the world, throughout history, people have seen ghosts. And if there's ghosts, then there's an afterlife. And more importantly, there is precedent for consciousness existing in a non-physical state. And what is God but simply a non-physical consciousness, albeit an extremely powerful one? So it doesn't really prove there's a God, but it certainly supports that there's a God. So what proof do we have of ghosts? Well, quite a lot, actually. I mean, I've seen some things zip past me that were like, whoa, what was that? That looked like a ghost. I was in a, a house that was uh, reputed to be haunted. I was looking around, and supposedly there were lights that would fly around, and I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, phew, what was that? I think that was a ghost. So yeah, ghosts make a lot of sense. They make a lot more sense than God because people can actually see ghosts. People could take pictures of ghosts. People could take video of ghosts. People could take infrared images of ghosts. People could pick up electromagnetic fields produced by ghosts. Okay. Now, most skeptics will say there really is no evidence to support that ghosts are real. It's all circumstantial. It's all anecdotal. You know, it could all be hoaxes. But think about this. Think about this. If I was in a courtroom and I was a prosecutor and I said, oh, and the judge said, okay, what evidence do you have? Now, I carry the burden of proof. I'm the prosecutor. The client is uh, innocent until proven guilty. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, there's a guy on trial for murder and the judge says, okay, what evidence do you have that so-and-so committed the murder? And I say, well... I've got about a billion eyewitnesses who actually saw it. I have several photographs of him committing the murder. He caught him on video committing the murder. Caught him on an infrared camera committing the murder. Uh, got uh, got audio recordings of him, of him committing the murder, and uh, did an infrared scan of the building, and you can see the infrared image of him committing the murder. Then the defense attorney stands up and says, "Yes." But what evidence is there? Okay, so I think it's pretty fair to say ghosts are probably real. Especially when you compare them to things like space aliens. You know, people who claim they've seen space aliens, they always seem to be in bed, falling in and out of sleep, or they're in the car, and they're falling asleep while they're driving, or they're or they've just been hypnotized, they didn't know they were abducted until after they were hypnotized, and now they can remember. And the aliens are always very culturally specific. Whatever your particular... You never hear about an alien story from a culture that doesn't believe in aliens. You always hear from people from places uh, where after aliens were well-known, and they always look exactly like whatever that particular culture says aliens are supposed to look like. So it seems... It, it, it seems like there are a lot of holes in the alien anecdotes, but when it comes to ghosts, people are wide awake when they see them. There are multiple witnesses to ghost sightings. They, they're not alone, usually. They're, some guy goes into a room and sees a ghost, and then you know, a couple months later, a different guy goes into the same room who didn't know that there was supposed to be a ghost in there and sees the same exact ghost. I'd call that... I wouldn't call that proof but I would call it evidence. Very, very, very strong evidence. But, what are they? Are they really disembodied spirits? That, I don't know. It could be, and this is a possibility that must be considered, it could be that ghosts are some sort of holes in time that we could be seeing into the past. Very often ghosts are just repeating the events that happen around their deaths. So maybe 
we're not seeing a disembodied spirit. Maybe we're seeing a wormhole that's transporting light and sound from a previous point in time. That's a possibility which must be considered. It doesn't seem any more or less likely than disembodied spirits, but if they are disembodied spirits, does that mean there's definitely one really huge spirit up on top of everything? Not really, because ghosts, there's a reason why ghosts look human. There's a reason why ghosts act and think like human beings, because they used to be. They used to be human beings. But God, on the other hand, was apparently never a human being, or if he took a, took a human form at some point, he didn't start out as a human being. Unless there was some kind of apotheosis, like taking ambrosia or something, or maybe just absorbing, psychically absorbing the faith of followers turns you into a god. Possible. Possible. Either way, it does seem to suggest that there is evidence of something metaphysical or supernatural. So I'm going to put a pin in this one too. So we got three so far that are um, kind of a pin in them. The uh, astral projection, Ganesh drinking milk, and ghosts. So we're going to pause right here and until next time.